Golds, while the East German women took 11 of 13 events. In Seoul, the U.S. and East Germans were still the leaders, but swimmers from around the world would challenge the two swimming powers. The stage was shared by many, but the spotlight belonged to three. All eyes upon Janet Evans, her first race, the 400-meter individual medley. The fastest qualifier in lane four, counting down from the top of your screen. And Kathleen Norton, lane five. The field rounded out by Clatworthy, Dendova, and Lynn Lee. Boy, that looked like somebody was rolling a bit up in lane two. But it's a good over. start. And Janet Evans swimming three down from the top, swimming just off the lead that is now held by the 16-year-old from East Germany, Daniela Unger, at the top of your screen in the white cap. This is the event Tracy Calkins won by 10 seconds in Los Angeles. Because there's four different strokes, the lead could change according to the different swimmers' strengths. Donna Deverona won this in Tokyo. The butterfly is the first 100 meters, two lengths of that stroke. Then they go to the backstroke, to the breaststroke, and to the freestyle. It should be pointed out that Janet Evans, who's swimming third down lane three, is best at the final two strokes. Pegging it to the final turn at a 6'17 year old Janet Evans, 101 pounds, who's got to stoke herself with food all day to keep that body weight up to 101. Evans with a substantial lead, and now they come to the final 50 meters. The moment of truth for little Janet Evans. Could she do it? She's Could got she it. Janet Evans fighting to hold on. She now has 20 meters to swim, and now they're coming to the wall, and Janet Evans getting close. She's going to win gold. Janet Evans of the USA wins gold in the 400-meter individual medley. 800 meters, second start after a false start is a good one. 16 lengths of the pool. The third place finish swimmer right now, Anka Morning, although Julie McDonald, an 18-year-old from Australia, is starting to come on somewhat. Swimming in lane three. No question, this is the bell lap, meaning two lengths remaining. And the crowd from Australia is beginning to acknowledge that there's a race for silver medal. And now Janet Evans, those little arms, those small legs kicking, powering out. Strauss is coming on, though. Ten meters to swim. They'll not catch her. Janet Evans going for the goal. Three for three as Janet Evans comes to the wall and wins the gold medal. Back in the pool. Now we come to the final hundred meters, and they are faster than a world record split. The world record holder, Janet Evans, in the dark cap with the American flag, swimming just a bit above. Heike Friedrich of East Germany. Maybe a quarter body length lead. Now she extends a little more. They're coming up with 60 meters to swim. In 10 meters, they go to the turn. And the final 50 meters. And here comes Janet Evans to the wall to make the turn for home, going for her second Olympic gold medal. What guts, Don? What guts? A battle all the way, and it turns out as the coaches thought it would. Evans against Friedrich. Janet Evans, catch her if you can. And in hot pursuit is Heike Friedrich. But now as the race wears on, Janet Evans is putting away the East Germans. They can't stay with her. Janet Evans has put away Anka Mooring in lane five. And fading fast in lane two is Heike Friedrich. Evans is going to go wire to wire. Janet Evans has put away the East German threat. And Janet Evans goes to the wall with a world record time. She smashed a world record and wins Olympic gold for the second time here in Seoul. The manner in which she dominated East Germany's Heike Friedrich and the rest of the field seemed to surprise even the 17-year-old high school senior from Placentia, California, Janet Evans, living proof that sometimes the biggest of surprises come in small packages. Gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Miss Janet Evans Wilson. <laughs> oh, wait, no, not yet. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
Great. So thank you for that. I am humbled. And um, I think one thing that Steve was going to mention but didn't is that I am a J. Sarah parent. I am a new J. Sarah parent. Um, so this is pretty impressive. Um, this is really impressive. So I'd actually like to thank my rising freshman daughter for choosing J. Sarah um, because I am very excited to be a J. Sarah parent for at least four years now. Um, so thank you. Thank you for the warm welcome. Unfortunately, I am way too old to have ever uh, competed for J. Sarah or swum for J. Sarah, but um, it feels like home. So thank you very much. Um, I would be remiss without starting the evening congratulating all of the athletes in the audience, um, all of the retired athletes, all of the current athletes, and all of the athletes um, that will come back to J. Sarah next year to compete for this amazing place. Um, so this evening, I speak to you. I speak to the parents, and I speak to the uh, administration, the athlete department, but I mostly speak to you because being a parent that was once an athlete, I understand your journey and I understand where life is going to take you. And I understand the importance that athletics plays in not only your high school experience, but the journey you take after high school and the journey you take well into adulthood. Um, from that video you just saw, which I couldn't really tell, but it's usually pretty grainy, so because um, it's really old. Uh, so I, it's off of VHS, so I, I apologize for that. And maybe the team here at J. Sarah did a great job digitizing it or something. Because, um, but my journey began in high school, so I experienced a lot of what you experience now. I just went to the Olympics after my after my junior year of high school, but my journey really took me a long way after my high school experience. And what I learned in high school as a high school athlete really helped. So I'm gonna talk about my journey tonight and I hope it can relate to yours. I grew up here in Southern California, North Orange County. I learned how to swim because my mom doesn't know how to swim, uh, still doesn't know how to swim, won't put her head underneath the water and she didn't want my two older brothers and I uh, not to know how to swim. Was I a good swimmer when I was young? Yeah. I was a good swimmer. Was I a great swimmer? Was I a protege that people looked at me and said, she's going to be amazing? No. If you noticed in that video, all they say is, she's little, she's tiny, she has to eat food, like she's tiny. Her stroke is really funny, right? So imagine that when I was like seven, eight, nine, ten years old, right? I'd go to meets, I'd win a race, and people would say, oh, well, she won, but her stroke looks really funny. Or oh, but she won, but she's really tiny. She can't, she can't do anything. She's so tiny and her stroke is so funny. So when I look back on my young swimming days here in Orange County, I think I had a chip on my shoulder because I always thought, well, I might be tiny, but I'm mighty <laughs> and I can do this and I don't care how tiny all of you think that I am. In 1984, aging myself here, uh, the Olympics came to Los Angeles. I was 12. Uh, my parents took my older brothers and I to the Coliseum, and I sat in that opening ceremony, and I watched the incredible uh, American decathlete Rafer Johnson. For all you parents out there that might remember, I watched Rafer Johnson light the Olympic cauldron. And I know it was moving for all of us, but for me, it defined who I was as a young person. You know, the Olympics were boycotted in 1980. I was too young to remember the 76 Olympics. So the 84 Olympics here in Los Angeles were embedded in my, in my who I was. I wanted to be an Olympian. I wanted to march into opening ceremonies wearing our country's uniform um, behind our country's flag. I wanted to represent our country at the Olympic Games in the highest honor of sport. I remember after the Olympics, I went back to my coach. I was still a very good swimmer here in Orange County. And I said to him, I want to go to the Olympics. I am going to be at the next Olympic Games. And he said to me, yes, you are kind of tiny, <laughs> but I think you can do it. But I need to remind you on a frequent basis about instant gratification versus future rewards. I think especially as someone that was about to go into high school who wanted to be an elite athlete, instant gratification and future rewards are a very tangible thing 
that you have to accept. Instant gratification to me, when I started my freshman year in high school, would have meant turning the alarm clock off when it went off at 4.05 in the morning. Because for you aquatics people out there, as you know, we swim, we're a little crazy, we swim at 4.45. So instant gratification for me before morning workout would have been to turn off the alarm clock, rolled back over and gone to bed. I just gotten up and gone to school like every normal person seems to do. But every morning when that alarm clock went off and my dad was in my bedroom shaking me or like flashing the lights to make sure that I would wake up, my first thought was, gosh, I can't wait to go back to sleep. And my second thought was, gosh, I can't wait to march in opening ceremonies at the Olympic Games. The second thought was always a thought that got me out of bed, got me in a cold swimming pool and had me swimming six miles before I went to school and that thought also had me swimming another six miles after school. In the four years from watching the 84 Olympics to competing in the 1988 Olympics, I never missed a practice. If my mom was here, my dad was still with us, he would say, they would say to you, before she got her driver's license, Janet would have walked <laughs> to practice. Did I love practice? No. I think any athlete sitting out there who says to you they love practice is not telling you the truth. There's a great athlete once, his name is Muhammad Ali, and he said, I hate practice, but I live every day going to practice so one day I can become a champion. To me, practice was doing my homework. Practice to me was understanding what I needed to do as an athlete. So when it came time for me to compete, I could execute like I knew I could. In the summer of 1987, after my sophomore year of high school, I was about, I don't know, 85 pounds. I was probably 5'3". I broke a world record or two. And I remember when I broke those world records, people said to me, that's amazing. You're really good, but you're really small. You're amazing, you're really good, but yeah, the Olympics are next year and you've never really swum against the Europeans. It's gonna be pretty tough. And my response was, well, I guess we'll see. My goal is to be an Olympian. My goal not necessarily was to win gold medals at my first Olympics, because I had people telling me I was too small, my stroke was too funny. And remember, all I really wanted to do was go to opening ceremonies and march in behind my country's flag and get all the really cool swag that you get, right? Because everyone was telling me I couldn't win at the Olympic Games. In the summer of 1988, I made my first Olympic team. Our Olympic trials were in Austin, Texas, and the Olympic Games were in Seoul, South Korea. We had six weeks between the Olympic trials and the Olympic Games. When you become an Olympian, which was my dream, it's really cool, like, it's really cool. You get two suitcases full of new clothes and all of the new clothes have those incredible Olympic rings on them and Team USA. And I thought, wow, remember I was in high school. This is amazing. This is what it means to be an Olympian. I have Olympic t-shirts for the rest of my life. I can wear Olympic rings, right? On my uh, 17th birthday, the Olympic team flew from Austin, Texas. We flew here to Orange County and we went to Disneyland on my 17th birthday, a place I'd been millions of times. But on my birthday, we had to parade down Main Street for the Olympic team and we got to cut in line for any ride because when you're an Olympian and you're wearing an Olympic shirt, you get to cut in line. After we went to Disneyland, we flew to Hawaii for three weeks without my parents and without my coach. And I was having a great time. I was body surfing, I was drinking chocolate milkshakes, because you know what? My goal of making it to the Olympics had come true. I was an Olympian and no one thought I could win. I was too little and my arms were really funny when I swam. So why would I bother winning? I was just happy to be an Olympian. I was showing up to practice but I maybe wasn't trying quite as hard as I could have at practice. And one day a man walked up to me. The parents will know who he is. The athletes, I'm not so sure. He walked up to me and he said, hey, um, he looked familiar, I didn't know him. He said, hey, hey, Janet, didn't introduce himself. Hey, uh, what's it like to be an Olympian? And I said, oh my gosh, 
You have no idea what it's like to be an Olympian. I have this cool swag. I got to go to Disneyland. I'm here in Hawaii without my mom and dad. No one can tell me what to do. And for the rest of my life, I told this man, for the rest of my life, I'll be an Olympian. It's pretty cool. And he goes, yeah, I know I'm an Olympian. And I said, oh my gosh, like we're like friends, right? Like we're automatic friends because you're an Olympian. I'm Olympian. This is great. Were you a swimmer? And he said, yeah, yeah, I was a swimmer. And I said, oh, when did you swim? He said, I swam in 1968. I said, okay, great. How did you do in 1968? And he said, oh, I won two golds and a silver and a bronze. I just did okay. Now here I am just wanting to march in opening ceremonies and I have a guy telling me winning four medals at the 68 Olympics was just okay. And I said, so what's just okay about four Olympic medals and one Olympic games? And he said, oh, none of the golds were individual medals. So I wanted to go back and I wanted to swim in 1972 and I wanted to win an individual gold medal. And I said, well, did you swim in 72? And he said, I did, I did. I said, well, how did you do? And he said, yeah, I, uh, I swam seven events. I won seven gold medals. I broke seven world records. It's really great to meet you because my name is Mark Spitz. So I had just told Mark Spitz for all the young people, he's the Michael Phelps of my generation, that being an Olympian was really cool because he was gonna, he was gonna be my friend forever. So that's my, uh, that was my wake up call for how cool it is to be an Olympian. But Mark Spitz had a message for me. And Mark Spitz's message was this, it's really great to be an Olympian, but it's greater to be an Olympic champion. And I said, yeah, Mark, I get that, I hear that, but no one thinks I can win. And he said, well, I think, I think you can win. And I said, I know, but I'm small. And he said, I think you can win. And he said, you know, Janet, in life, when you reach a goal, you gotta reset your goals. And sometimes you gotta reset those goals quicker than you, you think you want to. I know you wanna sit here and you wanna enjoy what it's like to be an Olympian, you wanna have a great time here in Hawaii, but you might only have one chance to go to the Olympics. Make it worth it and believe in yourself because I believe in you. That's kind of all I needed. I think in life, in sport, to be successful, we all need a champion. We need someone that can tell us things that we might not be ready to accept or might not be ready to shoot or aim for. Mark Spitz was that to me. The Olympic team left Hawaii and we went to Seoul, South Korea where we moved into the Olympic Village. I was feeling pretty good about myself. My weight had gone up, I was about 99 pounds. I'd grown like an inch. So I was about 5'4 and we got to the swimming pool. My first major international competition ever. The swimming pool was, you know, pretty long, maybe longer than the width of this football field. And we got to the first day of practice. I was standing there feeling really great about myself. Mark Spitz believed in me. I thought I could win one medal. I had three chances and a woman walked up behind me. She was about six feet tall. She was about 180 pounds, solid muscle. I watched her jump in the pool and I inherently counted her strokes. She took 24 strokes to get to the end of the pool. I take 42. <laughs> I looked back at one of my coaches, Coach Schubert, I don't think it was you. I looked back at one of the coaches and I said, who is that? And they said, oh, oh yeah, that's, that's an East German. A little history on the East German women. The 19, uh, 1972 Olympics, they won no Olympic medals. In 1973, the East German government decided their athletes were gonna show the dominance of their state by uh, excelling at sport through other means. And at the 1976 Olympics in Montreal, the, uh, the, U, the East German women won 11 of 13 gold medals. The Soviets, same program, won 12, the 12th medal and the US squeaked by with one gold medal in a relay. We boycotted 1980, they boycotted 1984. This was our first Olympics where the Western world would be competing against the East Germans since 1976. They held almost every world record on the books. They were uh, bigger than life in many more ways than you can say. And as I watched this woman swim up and down the pools like a cruise ship, it just jumped in the Olympic pool and I was gonna be a little wind-up toy that was supposed to go catch her. I stepped back and I thought to myself, well, the heck with Mark Spitz. I have t-shirts, I got a trip to Disneyland. <laughs> I will be friends with Olympians for the rest of my life because there is no way I'm gonna beat these women. They were intimidating. But when I stood on the blocks for all three of my races, it didn't matter to me because my mind allowed me to think that I could win. 
I might have been the smallest person there. I probably wasn't the most talented swimmer there, although I, I was a good swimmer. But I was a swimmer there that believed in myself the most. And I was a swimmer there that had done my homework, practice every single day. When you stand at the starting line or at the start of a football game or on the base when you're playing your baseball game, you've done your homework. Now is the time to execute. If you've done it, this is your moment. Those were my moments in South Korea at the Olympics. It didn't matter that those girls were bigger than me. It didn't matter that my stroke was funny. It didn't matter that I was literally a foot shorter than them and 100 pounds lighter. What mattered is that I put my mind to what I was going to do. I put in the work. I believed in myself. And that's what got me to the wall first. When I left those Olympics, I came home. I was a senior in high school. I wanted to live. I was happy. I was Olympian. I had gold medals. But something happened in that switch after coming home from the Olympics. I took a scholarship to swim in Northern California at Stanford, and swimming became a chore. Swimming became something I didn't like. Swimming became pressure filled. Every time I jumped into the swimming pool, I was Janet Evans. I was that little girl with the big smile and the funny stroke that dominated. And every time I jumped into the pool and didn't break a world record or break an American record, people would say not nice things. The Stanford Daily, the San Francisco Chronicle, the Orange County Register, oh, Janet, she won, but she didn't break a world record. Oh, Janet, eh, she's getting old. Oh, Janet, this, Janet, that. And swimming became something I didn't like. I became a bad teammate. I started missing practices. <laughs> I started complaining when I was at practice. I wasn't a positive influence. You would think an Olympic champion would be a positive influence on any team. I was actually a negative influence. And in the middle of my sophomore year, I called up my parents who are now empty nesters. And I said to them, I'm quitting swimming. We're 18 months outside of the Barcelona 1992 Olympics. I'm gonna quit. I'm gonna move home, so deal with it. <laughs> and my parents who never told me what to do with my swimming, this one time said to me, don't quit. Don't do this, find a place that you can find some happiness with your swimming. You got 18 months to go. We know you can do it. I call up a man who just happened to be in the audience here tonight. His name is Mark Schubert, the current coach at the Mission Viejo Natadors. <laughs> Where we actually, I will say coach, the Natadors have a lot of up and coming swimmers. So like this is a, you know, we're a, we're a good place over here at J. Sarah to have a good, good swimmers here. Um, I called up Mark and I said, I'm, I'm unhappy. Make it fun for me again. Make it fun. He was coaching at the University of Texas. Mark tried. You can ask him. We tried to make it fun. But for me, the joy was gone. And the pressure of living up to always having to win when I jump in the swimming pool was almost too much for me to handle. I trained with Mark in Texas for 18 months. I made my second Olympic team. And we did all the great things. We got all the clothes. We went to the south of France for three weeks. But I didn't enjoy it. I didn't have fun. I didn't like it. I saw the Barcelona Olympics as a means to an end because I just wanted to win my medals, prove to the world I was still a good person because my name was Janet Evans and I could swim fast and I wanted to go home. My first race in Barcelona was the 400 freestyle, my favorite race. Um, and Mark Schubert walked up to be before my race and he said, there's a girl that swims next to you. She's a former East German. She's big, she's strong. And uh, she has a very fast last 50 meters. You've never raced her. Be careful. She could pass you. What I said to my coach was, I haven't lost this race in seven years. I'm the world record holder and the defending Olympic champion, and no one can beat me. You are never too good to learn from other people. You are never too good not to listen to your coach. You are never too good to think that you don't have to listen to anyone. Mark Schubert was right. She passed me in the last three meters, and I was touched out for the gold medal by 19 one hundredths of a second. I received my silver medal. I went into the media room, and the first question was, what happened? Which is a very typical of all of the sports reporters. What happened? The second question was, how does it feel to lose? How does it feel to lose? All right, here I am. I'm 20 years old. My entire identity is wrapped around winning. And I am being told 
that I just lost. I was crushed. I cried a lot. I picked myself up. I swam the 800 meter freestyle four days later. I won the gold medal, but I didn't win it for myself. I didn't win it for our country. I won it to prove to everyone that I was still a great person because I could still swim really fast. It was actually a very hollow victory. And I think, uh, I think now I appreciate my silver medal more than anything because I've, I've had to learn with that silver medal. I left the Barcelona Olympics with what any athlete would dream of, a gold medal and a silver medal in two individual events, but I was done. I wanted nothing to do with the sport of swimming anymore. I moved home again, <laughs> my parents weren't happy, and I re-enrolled up at Stanford. I wasn't gonna swim, I was gonna be a normal student, I was gonna join a sorority, um, I was gonna go to law school. Those were my dreams, I was 21 years old and my life was just beginning. And then one day, Mark Schubert called me and he said, what are you doing? And I said, oh my gosh, life without swimming is amazing. You have no idea. I don't smell like chlorine every day. My hair is getting long. I swear my shoulders are like shrinking coach. Like this is life without swimming is amazing. And he said, yeah, 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 whatever. I'm just calling to tell you that I'm leaving the University of Texas and I'm gonna be the head coach at Southern Cal at USC. And I said, that's great coach, that's fantastic. I will come visit you as I'm driving back up to Stanford where I am going to stay up past 10 o'clock and my shoulder is gonna continue shrinking and my hair is gonna continue to grow long and I'm not gonna smell like chlorine. And he said, actually, I'm calling because I, I think you need to swim again. And I said, I, I don't, I don't wanna swim again. I just told you coach, I'm, a, I'm gonna join a sorority. And he said, no, 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 you need to swim again. And I said, why? And he said, because you have a lot to learn. I said, what do I have to learn? He said, well, you have to learn how to be a champion. You're not a champion. I said, I'm, I, I'm a champion. I'm a, I don't know, it was up there on the screen. I, I don't, I'm too old to remember. I don't know, it was four time Olympic champion, national champ, I'm a champion coach. I'm a champion. He said, no, uh-uh, you're, you're a winner. You're a winner. But my fear is that once swimming is over, microcosm of real life, you're not gonna understand how to be a champion. You're not gonna understand that you're gonna lose. <laughs> you're not gonna understand that life's gonna throw you speed bumps and you're not gonna understand how to be a good teammate or a good loser or even a good winner. You need to come back, you need to swim for four more years and you actually need to learn how to be a champion. Well, I didn't wanna do it. Who would really wanna swim 10 miles a day for four more years when life is like calling, right? But his point was valid. I inherently knew that the way I had left swimming after the Barcelona Olympics wasn't the way I wanted to leave a sport that had brought so much in my life. And I also inherently knew that I needed to become a person outside of swimming. My whole identity was wrapped up with my sport. And my sport wasn't going to be my whole identity for the rest of my life. So I enrolled at USC and we made it my goal to learn how to lose. We made it my goal to have a life outside of the swimming pool. And we made it my goal to not be Janet Evans, the swimmer. Every day when I left the pool deck and I closed the gate, life continued for me. I wasn't Janet the swimmer. I didn't take my workout home. I didn't think about it. I became a student. I became a friend. I kind of met my husband, but he was a fraternity boy, so I couldn't associate with people like him because I was too busy swimming 12 hours, miles a day, but I eventually, eventually made my way. But I became a real person swimming at USC, and I lost more races in those four years than I ever had in my entire life. But I also realized as my dad used to say to me, if you don't touch the wall first, the sun's still gonna come up tomorrow morning and your parents are still gonna love you and it doesn't change who you are. I graduated from college, I met people. I was Janet Evans, a student, a friend, a daughter and a swimmer. And in the summer of 1996, my journey took me to my third Olympic team. My goal was to go to the Olympics and swim as fast as I could. Not necessarily win, but in our six week training camp in Knoxville, Tennessee, it wasn't the South of France and it wasn't Hawaii. I started reading the newspapers and the newspapers said, well, if Janet wins more gold medals 
She'll have this many medals, Janet this, Janet that. This is what the medals from Atlanta look like. And I started thinking, gosh, I want to go to the Olympics and I want to win. I want to win because I am Janet Evans and I can be a champion at everything else. But when it comes to the Olympics, I really need to win because I still hadn't reached that threshold where my identity wasn't wrapped around Janet Evans, Olympic champion. So here I am sitting in Tennessee, waiting to drive to Atlanta and a gentleman calls me and his name is Billy Payne. Some of you might recognize Billy Payne. He's the former chairman of Augusta, but before he went to Augusta, he was the chairman of the 1996 Atlanta Olympic Games. And Billy had become a friend of mine through the years. And Billy called me up and he said, hey, Janet, uh, I need a favor of you. He's the boss at the Olympics. I need a favor of you. And I said, okay, what do you need? And he said, well, I need you to run the torch at opening ceremonies. I'm not gonna tell you who's passing you the torch. I'm not gonna tell you who you're passing the torch to, but you will be the second to last runner with the Olympic torch and the final woman to carry the Olympic torch. And I said, yeah, that's, that's a really nice gesture, Billy. I really appreciate it, but I don't go to opening ceremonies. And what I failed to mention was that Mark Spitz told me not to go to opening ceremonies because swimming starts the day after. And most swimmers don't go to opening ceremonies because we're home resting. And my dream of going to open ceremonies wasn't compatible with my dream of becoming an Olympic champion. So I never got to go to opening ceremonies. So I never understood what it was like to march in behind my country's flag to represent us at the opening ceremonies. So when Billy Payne asked me to run the torch, it didn't mean a lot to me. I was the athlete at the Olympics living in the village with 10,000 other athletes who only ate with Americans, preferably swimmers. Sometimes I branched out, but I didn't want to meet athletes from other countries. I was there to win. The Olympics was my place to win gold medals. I wasn't worried about meeting the basketball player from another country. I just wanted to win. And I didn't understand the meaning of the Olympics and the meaning of the torch. So when I was asked to carry the torch, I said no. And Billy Payne, he's a Southern man, and he was very convincing, and he kept asking me to do it. And finally, he asked me, why would I not do this? And I said, well, let me flip the question on you. Why should I do this? And he said, because if you run the torch at the opening ceremonies of the Olympic Games, it will be the greatest moment of your Olympic career. And I very distinctly remember thinking, this man doesn't know what it's like to win a gold medal because clearly winning a gold medal is much, much better than running in a stadium with an Olympic torch. And I kind of said that to him and he said, no, no, you, you, you need to do this. And so I agreed half-heartedly and with trepidations, trepidation, I agreed to run the Olympic torch at the opening ceremonies. And on the day of opening ceremonies, I was picked up in the village under the cover of something because I wasn't allowed to tell anyone. And I was taken to the opening ceremonies where 10,000 athletes had already marched into the infield and someone was gonna be waiting for me at the top of the steps to light the Olympic cauldron. I literally get pushed out of the tunnel in Atlanta onto the opening ceremony field with an Olympic torch. And it's dark and there's athletes standing on the infield and Evander Holyfield starts running to me with the Olympic torch. And I think, hey, this is kind of cool. Like I get to meet Vander Holyfield. Like I don't really know what I'm doing and I have to run all this way, but this is gonna be cool. Vander Holyfield runs to me, passes me the Olympic flame. I don't really know what to do. I turn around and I start running. I'm worried about myself. I'm a swimmer. I'm gonna fall. I'm gonna light the stadium on fire. I'm gonna catch my hair on fire. I have no idea what I'm doing. I just know that even though I'm a terrible runner, I have to put one foot in front of the other and I have to make it up these three humongous ramps to get to the top, to get this whole thing over with because gosh darn it, I need to swim the next day and I'm gonna win my gold medal and I need to get off of this track to go home and win. And I start running the torch and I have all those thoughts through going through my mind. And then I look to my left and there's all of the athletes 10,000 of them. The Americans had pushed their way to the front. They were in the front. So there was like the, the volleyball team with the gymnast on their shoulders. <laughs> and there was the water polo team with their bleached hair. And they were saying something like, she's gonna fall because she's a swimmer and swimmers don't know how to run. And they were laughing at me. And I saw my people, the Americans. 
And as I ran with this torch, I noticed that all the athletes were moving with it. They weren't moving with me and they weren't looking at me because the torch was up here, but they were moving with this torch. And I thought, gosh, that's incredible. These athletes are, are drawn to this, to the torch, to these opening ceremonies. This is incredible. And I stopped thinking about falling or lighting my hair on fire. And I start thinking about all those athletes that were at the Olympic games. Do you know that 90% of the athletes who compete at the Olympic games do not win medals? No medals. They don't go home with gold or silver or bronze in their swim bags or their backpacks, 90% of them. So opening ceremonies, the tradition, the history, the meaning of competition, that's, that's their gold medal. And as I was running this torch, I realized that. I realized that the vast majority of athletes that compete at the Olympic Games aren't there to win medals, but they're there as a part of their journey. They're there because they got up every morning at 4 a.m. They're there because their dad shook them and woke them up and drove them to practice. They're there to represent their country and their families and their friends. And they're not worried about winning. They're worried about being a champion. I had this epiphany. I had this moment. And I somehow got to the top of that podium. And who was standing there waiting for me, if any of you remember, but Muhammad Ali. And you talk about a champion. And you talk about someone who was an absolute shadow at that moment of who he was in 1960 as Cassius Clay when he won his Olympic gold medal. And there was a brief moment when I was passing him the flame that I looked in his eye. And it was incredible because he was looking at me and I was looking at him. The stadium was shaking. It felt like an earthquake. And he looked at me like, I'm going to do this. Because at practice the night before, Muhammad Ali dropped the torch in practice 12 times out of 12 in practice. And that is what Billy Payne whispered in my ear right before I ran out. You need to help Muhammad Ali if he drops the torch. So when I looked at Muhammad Ali, my message to Muhammad Ali with my eyes was, get this done, you better get this done because I don't want to help you. And the moments that Muhammad Ali was lighting that cauldron and his hand was shaking, if any of you remember, it was, shaking. It was the longest 10 seconds of my life. But once he lit that cauldron and it worked and the look in his eye and the moment for him, he was a champion. He wasn't going to go out there and win a boxing gold medal, but he was saying to the world, it doesn't matter where you are in life. It doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter if you're sick, you're a champion. And the inspiration he gave those people in that stadium that evening, including me, still sticks with me. Life isn't always good. Life's hard. Life's throw you curveballs. There were no curveballs for anyone in life in that stadium harder than Muhammad Ali that evening. He took a chance. He stood in front of the world and he lit that Olympic cauldron. I meet people all the time who say to me, Oh my gosh, I remember you. You beat these Germans in 88 and you won a couple more gold medals in 92 and you passed the torch to Muhammad Ali in 1996. And I say to them, actually I swam in 1996. And they go, you did? And I said, I did. And they say, but did you win a medal? And I say, no, mm -mm. I didn't win any medals in 1996. I got ninth in my first race. And I got sixth in my second race at the 1996 Olympics. I don't have a medal to show from the Olympic Games in Atlanta. I was disappointed. I wanted to win. But there is one piece of memorabilia in my home down the street that's displayed. And it's not my Olympic medals. It's my Olympic torch. Because that was the evening and that was the Olympics where I learned what it means to be a champion. Being a champion is, is many, many things, right? For me, becoming a champion began in 1988 when I realized that the journey takes you to a point 
where you have to believe that you can do the impossible. 1988, as a junior in high school, taught me you can be little, you can be small, people can tell you you can't do things, but put your mind to it and you can do it. 1992 taught me that you have to have perspective. Perspective is the most important thing that you can have in anything you do. It's a sport, it's a job, it's life. Perspective, it doesn't matter. Like my dad said, the sun's gonna come up the next morning. And in 1996, I learned that you have to have balance. Balance, because sometimes you're gonna win and sometimes you're gonna lose, but you have to be a whole person. You have to be a student, a parent, a daughter, you have to be all of those things. It doesn't matter. You have to have balance. So that was my journey to becoming a champion. That's what the Olympics taught me. So for all of you out there, for all of you athletes, you have incredible journeys coming your way and your journeys will continue. Your journeys aren't just for your athletic career. Your journeys are for the rest of your life. So I encourage you to take what you're learning here at J. Sarah and take that journey and become an even greater champion than you already are. Thank you so much. God bless and good luck to all of you. Thank you. Oh. How about that? I mean, how do you top that? Unbelievable.